It's uh, everything I dreamed of. I want to tell my dad that I love him. I still don't know what just happened. I'm just so grateful. Just so grateful for the opportunity to play this game. The legacy is not what you give people, it's what you put inside people, but also what they put inside of me. Hey everyone, welcome to Beyond the Locker Room with Maria. Maria Prekagis here and another crazy, as I like to say, bonkers week in the NFL. Let's get right to it with T-Bone's Take. Hi everybody, good to see you. Or good to be here, I should say. Good to hear you. Good to be here. Good to hear you. We're, uh, there's a little cold going around town. Not COVID. We've all done our COVID test. I did two last week, just in case. But it's weird having a little bit of a cold during all this craziness. Well, we live in a uh, you know a resort town, too. So there's a bunch of people in town. Um, yeah. They're all from California, Oregon, and Washington. I believe they call themselves the cows. <laughs> the cows? That's what they made themselves. Oh, California. California, Oregon, Washington. I know. My girlfriend told me that the other day. I laughed. I love her. It's funny you heard it, and then two days later, I got it. I was talking about her last night. We had a little Christmas dinner. got my Christmas hat on um, early with my brother. And I was talking that uh, Blair and I have the same Pete Carroll crush, although let's just start there. What is up? Russell Wilson. He could have scored at the very end, and he didn't. He doesn't look so good. No, I feel like his, maybe he's coming back, and his, he can't feel the ball with his hand that he hurt. Oh, maybe and that's it. I, and I just feel like they're just uh, – they, I mean, being a Seahawks fan has been so nice for so long that <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, like this year's the first year they're like, yeah, you know, we're not that good. <laughs> or they just don't say anything. No, that's funny you say that because driving here this morning at Grumpy's, by the way, come get your burger and beer, wear your mask inside. Um, I was thinking that. I go, wow, it's been so great for so many years and now they're going to be rebuilding probably. Yeah, they say that Russell Wilson might be on the move. Um they say a, the most realistic landing spot would be uh, New Orleans and then possibly Philadelphia. I've seen that, too, because Philadelphia received their third first draft pick because Carson Wentz played 75 percent of the snaps. Wentz wagon. Wentz wagon. You're still on it. I oh, yeah. like it. The guy's awesome. Why not? Um, but yeah. Oh, and we have to back up to college. The Potato Bowl. Wyoming won. And they showered the coach instead of Gatorade with a bucket of French fries. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. That is awesome. I always like to uh, watch the uh, blue field, too. There were some Idaho fans, you know, Idaho, I-D-A-H-O, Idaho, go, go, go. But they just hate Boise State, so they, like, refuse to watch the game because they hate the blue turf so much. It's weird. And then the Eastern Washington University has a red turf, and then a couple years ago the NCAA is like, no one else can do a colored turf. We're I think done. that the Cyclones have orange. There's an orange turf somewhere, too. Crazy, crazy. But back to the NFL. All right, back to the NFL. Um, what did you want to go with first? How about let's get over this this NFL COVID scare. I mean, it's not a scare. I guess everybody's getting it. Travis Kelsey's on it. Um, what's their the receiver? Hill. Tyreek Hill, their best receiver. Yeah. So they have their tight end out, their best receiver out, and they're both vaccinated, I believe, too. Travis Kelsey is. So hopefully he'll be back Sunday. But, I mean, would you rather get your team – now infected so it's over with when you get to the yeah. playoffs you go to the super bowl or well yeah the i mean the browns baker mayfield was out the coach was out they had there were i think four teams with over nearly 20 people with yes. covid and most of them are vaccinated mm-hmm. breakthrough cases the omicron though is going rampant and so. uh it was washington too they had yeah. to use their third starting quarterback third string quarterback so they had uh guys test last night then they stayed in virginia then they uh, would send the, the a test to the lab, and if they passed, then they'd like ship them over, the UPS them over, you know. <laughs> <Isn't> <laughs> it? Well, it's just like crazy. for Christmas presents, you know. Now the Omicron, I mean, thankfully people are vaccinated; they are asymptomatic, mm-hmm. but it's crazy. And yeah, there you were the one who was like, "Well, yeah, we have two more games on Tuesday night. Your team and my team." And of course, Seahawks lost. Eagles won. Yay! Yay! But you know. If you're the Browns and you still play without your starting quarterback, is that fair? And then everyone else gets postponed? I mean, it kind of sucked for the Eagles, too, because the uh, Washington Reds, sorry, the Washington football team, yes. that was so rude of me. Oh, my God. I always give people, like, the hardest time for saying that, too. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the Redskins had an outbreak, and the Eagles had to wait and be postponed until Tuesday, and then they have to play – the Giants a division game on Sunday so it's kind of like they're both going to be playing on short weeks yeah that's true it's like it's something we've never seen so they're just trying to do but they usually like remember when they said if if it was unvaccinated players that caused a like an outbreak that you would be forfeiting so I guess it's all 
Is it oh, because they're yeah, vaccinated? Because, you know, who knows? Who knows? Don't even get me started about the fake vaccine cards. Uh, oh, but that's a funny thing, too. <laughs> it's like, so let's go to Tom Brady. Um, oh, he got he- shut out. At home for the first time in like 179 games. And let me tell you, he threw that Microsoft Surface. (laughs) He's human. Yeah. I mean, he has games like this every once in a while. He usually scores points. But he also lost Leonard Fournette, his starting running back, his uh, Chris Godwin ACL out for the season, and Mike Evans went out. And all of a sudden, this guy, Antonio Brown, who was behind the scenes, and they're like, this guy is just not right for the team. He, you know, we're going to get rid of him. And now, now they're all down receivers and players, and they're like, hey, he's coming back on Monday. <laughs> he has one more chance and another chance because he's the only one left that can do anything on the field. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think statistically over the last couple of years, the Saints have really just owned Tom Brady, except for when he won the uh, Super Bowl with Tampa yeah. and he beat Drew Brees. But, I mean, they have just dominated him. I really wanted Drew Brees in that game. Yeah, Drew Brees is awesome. What do you, he's doing a great job on the NBC Sportscast. I heard that uh, Nick Saban, uh, when he coached Miami, he wanted Drew Brees. And uh, the management said no, so he quit and then went to Alabama. Oh, that's good. Isn't that good. I don't care if it's truth or rumor. That's a good one. He's a smart guy. And then, uh, let's see, um, Arizona. Yeah. Lost to the Lions. Okay, yes. Arizona Cardinals are now... 10 and 4 Lions are 2 11 and 1. What happened there? Kyler Murray had a good game, so did Jared Goff. I feel like uh the Lions are just, you know, hitting a little stride here. They're getting hot, but also the uh Arizona's DeAndre Hopkins got hurt and that's their best receiver and I think that like not having him in the mix really just you know, it just doesn't do anything good for the offense. <laughs> No. Like that guy opens up, he is getting double covered and everybody else is open. Now it's like everybody's normal. And yeah, you don't have the number one receiver in the NFL on your team. And it's showing. It's I a trickle know, down effect. I know, but to lose to the Lions? I know yeah. they've hit a little bit of a stride. But Jared Goff just... is so cool. He is. And he had three touchdowns, which obviously helped. And Kyler Murray and Colt McCoy both played. You know, is Kyler really back and well? I don't know. He just... He's so mobile and he's so good. I just think that, uh, yeah, I think that losing that receiver really just is not good, and they're it's showing. Yeah, they're being exposed. They they are. You have to have a full team, mm-hmm. and you know, even if people are out, you have to still. But win. at the same time, you know, any given Sunday. I love I love that. Or Monday, <laughs> like, or Tuesday, or Thursday. Like so, Dan- <laughs> Dana and I work with. We do picks, and he always picks the Lions. And like, he just looks like a genius the last couple of weeks picking them. I'm like, what is going on with you, man? Well, and let's go back to uh, the Eagles. They're seven and seven. Seven and seven. What did you guys start the season at? I think it was like oh and three. Yeah, we won one game on the opening day. And That's they're right. Like, they're like, you guys are gonna win nothing, and then we won one game. And they're like, you guys are gonna win everything. And now we're seven and seven. That's a t- That's like. A perfect record for the NFC East. Well, yeah, because there's, I mean, I'm looking at the playoff picture, and we'll go through that in a minute, but no one, only the Packers have clinched. So it's The says. Packers, I think, uh, are very good. And uh, Do you think Aaron Rodgers is going to get the MVP if he continues you know on? I think so. I think he he's proved that he's an amazing football player. He is. He, I mean, he's, yeah, he's unreal. And it's just, it makes me mad to say that because of things that have happened with him this year. But, you know, like, whatever. He's he's allowed to think. In, it's called Tovid. <laughs> but, you know, he's a great player. And, like, you just got to put that stuff aside and just look at it, him for his sports only. Yeah. And you can't deny that he is one of the best quarterbacks out there. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. And I'm and sure he's just like, hey, Tom, how are your receivers? <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be... So does the MVP necessarily have to go to the Super Bowl? No, they just like take the rest of the season off. They're like, who needs a Super Bowl? I'm an yeah. MVP. <laughs> but um, they say all the talk, though, with your Eagles, back to them, you know, Jalen Hurts, is he the guy? I, you know, I think that he is. He, I think that he at least earned himself another year. I mean, take your draft picks, maybe trade for a linebacker because you need one. And, uh, you know, I mean, like, if you go get Russell Wilson or something like that, your salary cap hit next year is $33 million. And next year with Jalen Hurts, it's $1 million and a half. So that's my thought on that. Yeah. Well, and he's doing well with them. So yeah. what the heck? 
Let's First see what... year coach. Oh, Rams. They look good. I think that uh, they have positioned themselves as a top team in the NFC East. Maybe not record wise, but they're definitely like better than Arizona, as I think we saw. Yeah. And then I'd love there's so my top three coach crushes are Pete Carroll. <laughs> I'm so bad. Yeah. Um oh god, I just blanked on his name from Pittsburgh. Help me out. Um Tomlin. Mike Tomlin? Yeah, Mike Tomlin and then the Rams coach. <laughs> Those are my uh, top three. Sean crushes. McVay, is that his yes. name? Yeah, he is pretty hot. He's got a nice uh hairdo. He does. Like and maybe he's so I'll, young. Maybe next time I'll just like ask for the McVay. I'll be like, hey, can you do my You're my, just kinda getting there. Yeah, well my my uh, brother's girlfriend is a uh, hairstylist, so I need her. I'm there. I need her badly. <laughs> anyway, there's my girly tidbit of the week. Um, what else do you have? Let's I have see. the uh, Colts. They are on fire. They are playing very well. They just beat the Patriots, which is unreal. And then, like, Carson yeah. Wentz isn't even really doing anything. He's just, like, throwing five receptions. They, like, took what the Pac- or, no, sorry, the Patriots did and did it back to them. They just ran the ball the entire time. They're, which like, is- they're like, thanks for the... Uh, the, thanks the for the play. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the game scheme here. <laughs> That's hilarious. So I have something. Um, two quick things. We already talked about the COVID and all that. So this year, more people are going for fourth downs and two point conversions than any other. That's what. So that's what they say on that ESPN uh, get up. But the two point conversions, there are a couple, especially the Ravens. They keep going for them and they don't work for them. To win the game. Yeah. Instead of taking a tie and then going into overtime. I think that they knew that, like, you know, let's just go for the win because I think these guys are going to, in the long run, just going to beat us anyway. Well, and they said, you know, do they have the manpower if they go into overtime to try to stop them again and again? I I don't think so. Yeah. (laughs) But it's been fun. I mean, it's kind of like Canadian football. They're using all four downs. I mean, Canadian football, they use all their downs. They rarely punt because they don't have as many downs. So, it's Canada. Did you know that <clears throat> The Rock's dad was the Canadian football player of the year one year? No way. Mm-hmm. His show's pretty funny. We love The Rock. So, yeah, uh, that's all I have on my list. What about uh, you? 49ers. I just think they're playing oh. really good ball. And, I would, and, like, they're getting healthy. And Jimmy G's, you know, he wants to stick around. And I think that... He's Tom Brady's protege, pretty much. I mean, we always forget that he grew up behind uh, Belichick and Brady. And I just think that he's ready to... I just think they're in a good spot. They're, like, winning. People are afraid of them. And no one really talks about them. So, except me. Makes my brother very happy. Yeah, and Rachel, who works here, too. They're big 49ers Oh, she's 49ers fans. Oh, and so's Dash, because, you know... This guy's got to team up on me or something. I don't know. <laughs> we love you, Dash. And then I got the Bengals win. Um... Teddy Bridgewater got hurt. That was kind of scary. He went out and got a concussion. He's okay. Um, Kellen Moore, I heard he's coaching his way out of a head coaching job. Because, I know. You told me that. Yeah. the uh, They said that he was the next offensive coordinator to get a head coaching job, maybe even in Dallas, but he's not doing – Dallas just isn't playing very well either. So, Well, Mike McCarthy was like, when we got into the O zone and everyone's like, what's the O zone? He goes, well, we have different names for you know, the red the, zone. Uh, thing in the sky I know. the earth. We just didn't score in the O zone. I'm like, huh? They were ripping on him this morning. It was kind of funny. And, but uh, Tom Brady he went to the sideline and yelled something at a coach. That was funny. I think it was yeah. a bad word. I don't know. I saw it on Barstool. It was pretty funny. You don't need to read lips <laughs> to figure out what he like, said. It was kind of like one of those things when you cut somebody off or they cut you off and then like they do a gesture or just like, you know, just their body language. Actions speak louder than words, yeah. I would say. Yeah, well, like I said, when he threw that surface, I'm like, he's, you know, he's human, and he has that big um, six part series, however I many part it. series he's on ESPN super- Plus, and I saw part of it, and Giselle finally lost it one day. Someone's like, oh, you can't, your husband can't throw, and she's like, he can't effing throw and catch the ball. Like he was doing everything. I remember that. And Tom Brady, so do I. And Tom Brady comes back on. And he's like, honey, you can't do that. I mean, they're so poised and they're such professionals in all that they do. I just like how competitive he is. Well, yeah. He's just like, got to win. <laughs> and everyone's like, he lost the MVP that night. I have night. to win. I'm like he didn't lose it for throwing the surface. Yeah. Microsoft's like, oh, that's going to cost us one. That was but awesome. that's okay. <laughs> so we're in week 16 of 18. I can't believe it. And there are a lot of games coming up. Um, let's see. 
Giants Eagles. We'll go with your team Sunday, December twenty sixth. They lost to them earlier this year, so I really hope that they win. I think the Eagles are on it. I'm going on the Eagles bandwagon, not just because I love you, but because I am. Here's one: Broncos Raiders. Raiders looked pretty good last week. Um, I'm going to go with the Raiders because I think Teddy Bridgewater's out and Drew Locke can't not throw three interceptions a game. Maybe two. Sorry. Well, uh, Washington Cow and Dallas. What is it? Washington football team and oh, Dallas yeah. Cowboys. Um, Dallas. Uh, let's see. Dolphins, Saints. I think Saints because they're on a high from last week. I'm going to go with uh, the Dolphins. We love the Dolphins, though. We love their quarterback. They've won a lot of games like in a row here, I think. Chargers, the poor Texans. <laughs> so this article this morning, he's like, I'm so proud of the Texans. Man, I picked them to go 0-17. And, and they really just done it. Out did me. <laughs> Oh, and 17. Yeah. What about the Bills and Patriots? We're going Chargers with that one. And then Bills, okay. Patriots. I mean, I got to go Patriots. Bill Belichick just owns them. Well, and the Jaguars and Jets, it's kind of the Jaguars. Really, Urban? I'm going to go Jets. Bye-bye. Yeah, I'm going to go Jets, too. That's for you, Howard, in Vegas. Mm-hmm. That's for Howard in Vegas. Um, Colts, Cardinals. You're going to still Colts. be on the Wentz wagon? Oh, I'm yeah. going to go Cardinals. I cool. think they come back. They better. And Browns, Packers. I'm going Packers. Packers. But in the hunt, it's weird. So look at this. Clinched a playoff spot in the NFC Packers. It's the only one. Everyone else in the AFC and NFC are in the hunt. There are a lot of people in the hunt. Yeah. On the bubble, the Ravens, I thought they were going to just go way stronger. Look at your Eagles are on the bubble. Yeah. Because all the I think Washington, all they had to do was win last night. And they would have... But the Seahawks are out. Five and nine. They're above the Giants, though. <laughs> Not by much. Yeah. So eliminated this week, Jacksonville, Detroit, Houston, New York, and Chicago. So there you go. It's going to be bonkers. Who, as of right now, Wednesday, December 22nd, Merry Christmas to all, by the way, who do you want to see in the Super Bowl? Um, Packers Chiefs. Packers Chiefs. I would take that, and I would go, I would want the Chiefs, but I think the Packers would win. Mm-hmm. I'm not a Patriots fan. Keep going down a little bit. I actually wouldn't. I wouldn't mind seeing the Colts in there either. Yeah, they got some work. You to know, do. I've seen so many fans that are the Colts fans that just like hate Carson Wentz. It's like you guys are still winning. Like, what do you care? Well, yeah, it's cool. It's the stupidest thing. It's like, what if he wins you a Super Bowl? You're gonna say that's stupid. No, then they'll be like, on the Wentz wagon with you. They probably won't. They'll be like, oh, I was coaching. You're like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Give the guy some credit here. Well, lots to look forward to Saturday games because there aren't a lot of college games. By the way, the bowl games, there are so many college bowl games and good for the sponsors out there that do this, but I've heard some names. We love the potato bowl and the french fries. but um, The Jimmy Kimmel bowl? Yeah, the Jimmy Kimmel bowl. I saw that in my... I I had to read it like three times. I'm like, is that like Jimmy Kimmel? Like, What's going on here? Like that Trevor Thomas bowl? Let's do it. Maria Precacci's Bowl? Yeah. Let's go. Grumpy's Bowl. Grumpy's Bowl. There. Now we're starting some. Pete. But anyway, um, up next, um, my buddy J-Rod's going to be in a couple weeks. He has a lot of interesting stories. He's busier than I am. And then, um, but coming up next, Mark Pattison. We're going to talk to him about his NFL career. And then he just summited Everest for higher ground and all this. So stay tuned. Lots of great content coming up on the beyond the locker room with Maria. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too. I, I love your hat you. by the way too. Thank you. Isn't that fun? It's Rudolph. If you it's guys Ru- can't see it, it's Rudolph with some antlers. They liked it at Starbucks this morning. I think next time I'll dress up as like something cool. I'll, A wear my, elf. I'll wear my leather jacket next week for new year's. All right. Take care out there and uh, watch a lot of football and have some fun over this holiday weekend. Bye everybody. All right, everyone, I'd like to welcome to the program Mark Pattison from Sun Valley, Idaho. We're probably down the street from each other right now doing a Zoom, but we're being safe, so I like that. We are. We are. I love it. And a nice winter snowy day. Oh, it's beautiful. You already went skiing today. I love it. How was the mountain? The mountain was great. Yeah, You know, it was interesting because um, it, it, it all my athletic skills have pretty much gone out the window, with, except my ability to snow ski. And because I can still ski like I did when I was 22, when it gets windy when it gets snowy when it gets you know low visibility you gotta go hit the trees so that's where i was most of the day is dodging trees coming down the mountains that used to be linebackers but now it's trees well and 
you know, you're used to the cold and wind. We'll talk about um, next week. We'll talk about your seven summits, actually nine and Everest. I did read a little mm. bit up on you, but let's talk. This is called Beyond the Locker Room with Maria. And I like to talk to people about their career, but also some quirky things and things people might not know about you. But let's mm. start early. How did you start? Did your dad get into it? Did he play? How did you start in football? Well, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and back in the day, you know, I didn't get on an airplane until my recruiting trip to the University of Hawaii. That was the first time I ever got on an airplane. And so, you know, every day, um, you know, I was out in the backyard. I was I was throwing the football with my friends, and we were just making up our own games. It was a much different time back in the day because there was no cell phones, as you know, and there's no social media, and there's no internet and all these things, and there's only three channels, really, CBS. ABC and NBC, and that was it. And um, and so I didn't spend a whole lot of time watching TV, maybe the Brady Bunch or the Partridge Family, and that was about it. And so the rest of the time is really using that creative sense of going out. And you know, I, I was fortunate. I was I just always had a knack for sports. I love sports. I was good at sports. And and so you know, it was kind of back in those days, those, those days too, where you know people weren't so specialized as they are today. So it was really the basketball thing and then the baseball thing and then the football thing. But it seemed like of those three sports, um, football came really easy and very natural to me. I just could see things that other people couldn't. I was born naturally fast. Uh, my parents, my dad was like five foot seven. My mom's probably five, five. I'm six, three. You know how that happened. <laughs> was the milkman involved? What the milkman probably could have. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So conspiracy theories, but you know, boy, I mean, I just, I grew up and football was kind of the number one thing. And I always spent a lot of time, you know, okay, you're USC and I'm Washington or, you know, these make believe games. And we have these little football contests out on the playground. And, you know, that's how I really started getting immersed into it. And like, like a lot of things, when you, when you start to excel in certain sports beyond just the love of the game, you know, it starts to have some, some momentum to it and some kick, and with that, you know, I kept, kept elevating up the different levels um, as, as I went, you know, ultimately to the NFL. Well, you went, you were a high school All-American. Uh, mm -hmm. You went to the Roosevelt Rough Riders, Rough Riders, right? Yeah, yeah, Teddy Ro Roosevelt. I the love it. So yeah. when did you decide or did your coach decide what position you would be best at? Was it in high school? Well, no, I mean, yeah, like, so growing up, you know, being one of the faster kids on the block, obviously, you know, I'm not going to be the guy that's going to play blocking. And so I could outrun most people and I did well at that. And so it was kind of the running back, you know, and then I kind of started to evolve towards the quarterback. And it wasn't until I got to high school, we had a really good quarterback. He was a year ahead of me as all state. Um, he'd always been a quarterback. He really knew the position. And so they said, like, well, we're going to put Mark. And so they put me at, at wide receiver. And, you know, that came very naturally to me because I could get out in the open field and run and catch and jump and all those things. And so it was just kind of a natural position and progression for me as I went. And then ironically, not a lot of people know this, but when I ultimately did go to the University of Washington, I was recruited. Um, well, going back in the story just a bit. Um, I was, I, so I played, um, uh, wide receiver, my, my sophomore and my junior year. And then my senior year, there's another future quarterback who played 10 years in the NFL, Hugh Millen. And, um, he was a year behind me, but he was, he had grown so fast. He was like six, four, 130 pounds that he literally could not take a snap, go back five steps and throw the ball up there. He'd always get tackled. So it was like, what's the point of having Mark out there if, if Hugh can't get him the ball? So it took me from wide receiver and they put me at quarterback. And so now it's my senior year, same accolades come along at quarterback. And so I ended up getting recruited as both a quarterback and a wide receiver at different colleges in the Pac-10 in those days, Pac-12 now, and throughout the country. And so um, at the end of the day, I really chose the school, not the position, even though I like quarterback better. Um, and so I did go to the University of Washington. I did, I, I did play wide receiver there, but with my sophomore year, I redshirted in there. My, my second year, I redshirted. We had a bunch of quarterbacks go down, so I played quarterback for the scout team that year, and I loved it. And the quarterback coach at the time uh, came over to me and asked if I wanted to switch the, my position to uh, quarterback, and I was pretty game for it because I, I loved it. I thought there could be some potential, and our head coach, Don James, shut it down in a second and said, you're not doing that. You're playing wide receiver, and that's it. <laughs> so that's that, and, and he made the right decision for me. 
I love it. So what was it like being recruited? It's so different now. People Mm -hmm. now in junior high and high school have trainers and coaches, you know, to go on to their collegiate career, even their high school and then collegiate and pro. But Uh what was it like to get recruited? I mean, did you just get phone calls? I know they had scouts back then. It wasn't that long ago. Not not making you ancient. You're still a, a whippersnapper in lots of ways. Yeah, no, it was a long time ago. And the times have changed to your point. Um, now there's transfer portals. And again, going back to the thing I was talking about earlier about specialists, you know, they're certainly in play of kids just doing one sport and one sport only. Um, that just wasn't the case, you know, back in the day. And so um, uh, the recruiting process for me really kicked in. You know, I started getting letters, a lot of letters all over the country and from places that like, how would they ever know my name or anything? And it was just so different because it was truly the letter and there was no cell phone. So they weren't texting you and and there was no social media to like also connect with you on Twitter and all that kind of stuff where people are doing announcements through all this. And so it was really old school in that, in that sense. Um, I had schools as far away as Tennessee that wanted me to come down there. I had, you know, all kinds of, of schools, pretty much most of the Pac-10 of those days, not every single Pac-10, not like USC, but most of them, Notre Dame, you know, they all reached out and I got letters. And so the question is the gauging the, the, the amount of interest, but you know, the thing for me is that I'd always grown up, my grandfather, my, my mom was actually a cheerleader at the University of Washington back in the day. And so she 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 was back in the day when skirts were exactly one inch off the ground. And so anything <laughs> higher than that was sacrilegious. And um, I'd grown up going to all the games with my grandfather. He was a big booster. And so, you know, I mean, I was pretty wired that I was probably going to go there um, to the UW and, and play for Don James. It was interesting because this would come into play in so many different ways, you know, down the road, but he would become a Hall of Fame coach. And and he was a Hall of Fame because, of course, he won and we went to all these bowl games and and that was wonderful. But it was really the blueprint to life, the blueprint of success, the blueprint to how you get things accomplished, which I really had to learn in order for things to kick into me, which have had a major carryover in my business life, executive of Sports Illustrated, my mountaineering life. And certainly for my football life. Well, I heard an interview with you and you were like, I went to, co- I mean, let's talk the difference between high school and college and then college mm-hmm. and pro. Oh, yeah, There's yeah. a big difference and you might be good in high school, but forget about college and then really forget about pros. There's such yeah. a dramatic difference, but you did say, you were like, I showed up that first day at the university of Washington and was just like, what, you know, I mean, you weren't the only good guy on the team. There was a lot of all Americans out there, high school. I mean, everybody was. So it, it just means you're all back to like square one, right? And uh, the I guess that the net net for me is that and everybody had like a different experience. For me, I had a much harder jump, way harder jump going from high school to college and college to the NFL. And those were two reasons. Number one, when I first got to the University of Washington, I didn't have the body frame. I didn't have the the mentality. I didn't really understand, you know, the body, mind, soul all working together. And it took me a number of years to like get myself strong so I could take on these hits and take on these these other potential NFL players that are going to go on USC, UCLA, Stanford, California, Washington State, Um uh, the Arizona schools, you know, there, there were a lot of good players back in the day. There's still good players today as well. But, you know, you just you got to before you even can compete, if you can't push people around and go knock heads and protect yourself, you know, that muscle is really there to protect your organs and your ribs and those things, especially as a wide receiver um, that you just you can't play. Right. And, and, and then the, the, the side benefit to all that is is when I got there, I was completely intimidated by all the older guys. And I was completely lost, but by slowly chipping away at it, getting bigger and bigger, getting stronger, getting faster and all those things, then my confidence was like the, the tailwind that's coming behind me to really help propel me to now I can take on any of these guys. Because, you know, especially when you get in the NFL, I mean, there's a lot of smack talk, right? And these guys are in your mug and talking and you got to be able to like take that on, right? And not let that get, get all rattled. And if you don't have the body and the and the physical skills and the mental skills to take that and, and bring it on, then it's going to be a tough go. Well, and we were talking right before we started recording how, you know, you're, especially with your mountaineering and all of that, what you put into your body is very, very important. It should be to all of us. It isn't all the time, but um, the holidays are here, but uh-huh. I was talking to Tom Drugas and I'm sure, you know, I'm real estate guy. And he said uh-huh. back then to uh-huh. bulk up, 
you just went to the smorgasbord. You went to the buffet. There were yeah. no diets. You just ate a lot of stuff to bulk yeah. up because yeah. there was no, you know, conditioning and nutritionists and all that. Did you always have a knack for eating the right thing and bulking up the proper way and getting there? No, I mean, I, uh, I didn't, that's something I had to learn again in high school. It was non-existent going back to the specialist thing and all these, you know, these, uh, these camps that these kids go to now, those things didn't exist back in the day. And so again, it really had to do, it was kind of a two-step process. It was one, um, you know, learning the blueprint of success, the pyramid of success through Don James to what I had to do. Like if I ever even want to have a chance to get on, you know, the thing to, to me that really taken to, 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 to point like later in my life is that, that just because I did all these things, you know, A, B, C, and D, lifting weights, doing running stairs, doing watching film, doing all this thing. It didn't had, it, it had no guarantees. It had no certainty that on the other side of that rainbow that I would find gold and I'd find the field and I'd be, be a, a starter. It just meant I was going to put myself in the biz, best position to play. Um, as it, as it relates to, to eating, um, I, I, I did fine tune, you know, back in the day, I was just, just trying to find my edge in whatever way. I didn't eat red meat for seven years. I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> Probably not good if I was going to go hang out at Grumpy's. But, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, you know, really being conscientious about potato chips, it's just things that are going to slow me down. What could I do to get an edge? And, you know, in, in college, you're not going to get cut, but you're just not going to play. In the NFL, you get cut. And I was always on that line, Right of of doing all the right things but just like you know you're you're there and you could not be there and so what could i do so i, I was just always like really whacked out in terms of, of doing what i had to do to 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 succeed well you're a competitor obviously and don james you know he was the man i think my parents went to every bowl game you went to yeah. two alohas two rose bowls and an orange bowl yeah so the Aloha Bowl is great. Orange Bowl, of course, fantastic. You had the play that put you guys ahead. Rose uh, Bowl, though. It's just so iconic. Oh, look at those. Nice. Just some ching ching. I love it. Yeah. So Rose Bowl, Rose Bowl, Orange Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry. No, no. Today. They're I got iconic. So, I, I, was, I was so taken by your comment of these bowl games. I've got these four. Actually, I went to five bowl games. But I got these four rings sitting in front of me. It just bling bling i had to like show those to you i love well i'm glad you did i made mark rippon get a super bowl ring out it was packed away in his bags because he was traveling i go go get oh. that out <laughs> when i interviewed him a while back but what's it like not even to be at the bowl game i've been to the rose bowl before it's just mm. it is it's iconic and it's weird because it's in the middle of pasadena you drive down you know yeah. side yeah. streets to get there and you park on the grass but what was that like not to only be there but to win these bowl games they're big yeah, no, it was it was crazy. Now, I, I think the best way I can illustrate that um, is I went to five bowl games. We won three, we lost two. Um, and, you know, my freshman year, um, if I go back to my senior year in college, or I'm sorry, senior year in high school, and I'm playing my last high school game, and we used to play at this old beat up stadium in the middle of the city by the Space Needle. That's kind of our iconic um, big, you know, icon that, that, that sits in the middle of the city and there's a restaurant on top, but there's a, there's a, um, there's a stadium down below that called Metro stadium. Yeah. And so we used to play there and all the teams of, of Seattle used to play there. And, and so we, you know, I think that the, the stadium filled maybe 15,000 people of which maybe six on the best day, you know, would be, you know, coming to your games. And now fast forward the clock, like 10 months, you know, I go to the university of Washington and we have a banner season. I'm just a freshman. I'm not really playing, you know, I mean, I got, I got some playing time, but I didn't letter or anything. And here I'm standing on the rose in the middle of the Rose bowl, something I've never been to before. There's 110,000 people and, you know, we're playing Iowa. No, we're playing Michigan. Uh, for, first year we played Michigan. And just the the iconic that the uniforms and just the hoopla and the Rose Bowl parade and all those kind of things it was really breathtaking. But you know, again, when you go from high school, because because you know half of this is mental and half of it is is physical. And on the mental side of being able to go out in front of of sixty five thousand people, which is what the University of Washington Husky Stadium used to fit, going from six thousand to sixty five thousand to one hundred ten thousand. And for a lot of people, that can be a really daunting moment. And so not taking the, 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 the moment and letting that overwhelm you, 
with stress and anxiety and you're, you're so, you know, out of your element because of everything else that's going on that you're not concentrating at the task at hand. And I think that's when you go to big time um, schools like the University of Washington and you're playing in, in, in big time um, football games or you're all these different bowl games. It just preps you, preps you, preps you towards those ultimate matches. In my case, the Orange Bowl, you mentioned that. And then, you know, playing against number two, Oklahoma, and on national television. So it's just not only the 70,000 people uh, in Miami, but, you know, the millions on television, which then, because of my performance there, I ended up getting drafted. And then, you know, so there's a whole art. But if you're not prepared and you haven't been in those situations, there's a lot of people that freak out. Right. And so that's the whole key is like maintain. Well, and that's, you know, you always hear announcers, you know, play by play. Oh, the jitters of the first, you know, the first couple plays. And yeah, how can you not sit mm-hmm. there? And I mean, just even being a fan in the stadium, mm-hmm. it's like, holy cow, look where we are. You just stop and take it in. But we only have to say rah, rah and cheer you on. We don't have to yeah. actually go and play a game and concentrate on what we're doing. But that's also where experience comes in, because I mean, we used to be out there and, you know, I mean, I couldn't really hear the band. I really couldn't hear the the cheers. I couldn't really, you know, it was just really us 11 on 11 going back to when I was a little kid, you know, at View Ridge Playfield in Seattle. I mean, that's, that's really what it got down to, you know, you just able to do what you have to do. And that can be the difference of somebody who's young and they're freshmen and out there playing. And that's one thing that's that, that it's hard for me to like digest these days um, is, is the fact that, you know, so many of these kids are playing right out of the gate and they haven't had to sit and watch and learn from the older guys out there. And if they don't like it, they say, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm going to the transfer portal and they're gone. And, and I look back at my time and like the best thing that ever happened to me is I had to sit two and a half years. My third year, I started to play special teams. So I started to like inch my way out of the field but I didn't really like go all out. Again, I was there for five years in my fourth and fifth year. So that's a long time to be in the dark and have to wait and watch the older guys go through it versus if you're in a transfer field, like, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm not getting my playing time. So I'm going to go do what I do. So the best thing for, I think for so many people is just, you got to hang in there, right. And fight through it. No, there are a lot of guys that never get to play and they just love the sport and they love to be part of the team. Yeah, that you have to want it and you have to wait. So how did you college? I mean, you had to go to school and then practice and play football and travel. What was that balance like? And how do you use that in today's world? Well, it's time management, right? And, and I guess in today's world, I, you know, I, I balance a lot of different things. I have a podcast called Fun Your Summit. Yeah. But I've got a, um, um, an executive for Sports Illustrated, as I mentioned, I work out twice a day in the morning and at night. And I'm involved in philanthropy with Higher Ground right here, a little plug. We love Higher and Ground. We will put the links, all of them below. Yeah, I know it's wonderful, but, you know, you got to be really, you know, I think it really goes back to my football training of really being, you know, in the moment and really be key and be really focused on what you're trying to do. And, you know, the amount of efficiency I can get done in a day um, is, I, I, you know, I, I'm able to, to do a lot and have a high impact on the things I'm trying to do. Um, because I don't let things float. So I'm in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, and disciplined um, of when I get up, when I'm on the the bike, when I'm having my seven summit smoothie, when I'm having my tea, when I'm going to start X amount of calls I have to make per day, going on the back end of the workout in the afternoon, you know, checking in with the philanthropy, you know, doing all these different things. And, and, you know, I think if you're not really buttoned up and again, going back to the blueprint what Don James taught me, like if you were, if, if you were, you, if you were five minutes early to a meeting, you were on time. If you're on time, you're late. And that's just the way it was. And he would like crush you in front of everybody if you showed up like a minute after the time. And so punctuation is everything, being on time, commitment, attention to detail, all those little things that we learned back in the day have had a profound effect for me on how I oper- my, operate my life today. Making lists, schedules. I make a lot of lists and then sometimes I don't look at them. (laughs) Let's uh, go forward to, you had a great performance in the orange bowl. You said it kind of catapulted you for all these pro teams. I'm sure they were looking at you before, but to really look draft day, a lot different now than then. I remember Mark Rippon was like, the phone didn't ring. So I took a nap. (laughs) I mean, what was draft day like for you? Did you know you had certain teams interested? 
What was that like? Yeah, that's an interesting process. Mark's a good guy. I've known him for a long time. I and, figured. Uh, yeah, I know we played against each other back in the day. And, you know, the, the, uh, it was interesting because everybody, and they still do this today, but well, first of all, there used to be, I think way, way back when like 18 rounds, and then they cut that to 12 rounds. And now it's seven rounds. I was a seventh round draft pick and, and people who don't really understand this, um, you know, it, there, there's a process and there's a flow um, and there's a certain pattern that you need to go through to ultimately put yourself in a position to be as a, as a drafted player or a free agent. And so for that is uh, you, you know, you, you come out of college and then the scouts start coming around and then you get invited to the combines. So they still do that today. Right now it's in, uh, I think it's in Indianapolis every year because it's in the middle of the country. Back in the day on that particular year, it was in um, Tempe, Arizona at the University of uh, Arizona State. Um, and so the, the one thing that made that challenging is that as a wide receiver, uh, it's all about your 40 time. I mean, there's a lot of tests that make you go through a full two-day thing. One day's physical, the other day, like a, a physical, physical from a doctor, all these different team doctors. And then the other day, the first day, I think it is, they're running you through all the different physical things of catching and running routes and jumping and how much you can bench and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But the most important factor, especially for me, was running a 40 yard dash and why they've ever set that as the, the all-time metric. Uh, why, like, not why isn't it 40? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why, why is it 50? Why isn't it 30? Why is it? I mean, you know, so I don't, I don't know any of those answers, but, but I do know that at Arizona state in those days, um, you ran on grass because that's all they had. They didn't have any AstroTurf. And so grass is typically was, was always a 10th slower than what you'd run on, on indoor, you know, flat surface. So at the end of the day, I had a great time and I, I ran as fast as I could possibly run. Um, but, you know, out of that, they, they give you kind of a, a draft range. And, I, and one of the things that like anybody who's listening to this that I've always found that has been useful, like just again, just another life lesson is be grateful for what you get and, and kind of like hope for the best, but expect if it doesn't go your way, that's okay. And I was over the moon tickled that I got drafted out of the 32 different teams that are out there. I got drafted by the Raiders in those days they're in, in, in LA. And when you think about 32 teams, you think really about 32 different cities. So I could have been in green Bay or Buffalo, these other places, which is much harder to catch the ball um, for some sure. than a, than a warm climate. Right. I grew up in a colder, damp climate. So, so, you know, being drafted by the Raiders was just an amazing experience. Um, and again, I, I rather than, then look at it as well. Why wasn't it? Because they had they'd rated me between five and seven, and I fell to seven. Who cares? I got drafted. Uh, Tom Brady was down there in the draft too. So yeah, he was number six. So just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> but but you know, so many other players that they're rejected at like third round and they fell to fifth, and their their whole day was a disaster. Like it, like it just didn't matter, right? Just somehow or another, get yourself on a team and get yourself out there and get things going, and so. From, from there, it's, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of two elements. Once you get to that point, now you're drafted, now you're wanted, and they, they see value in you. And the first part is trying to make a team, and that's a whole different animal. And then the second part of that is if, you can, if you're fortunate to make a team, then how do you stay on the team, right? Because <laughs> they got all <laughs> well, these just, people coming in and out, right? Well, just because you got drafted doesn't mean you're going to be on that team. People don't get that who don't understand football. That's it's right. like, you got drafted, but you still have to earn your spot. It's just beginning. I remember, and this is also something that served me well in life. You know, we were I, so so. I was fortunate because when I got to the to the Raiders, this is 1985 draft, and 1983, uh, the Raiders had been in the the Super Bowl. They beat the Washington Redskins, and um, I think Joe Theismann was the quarterback for the Redskins, and Jim Plunkett was for. Um, the Raiders. And so when I got there two years later, they still had all those same characters in the room, Al Zato, Howie Long, Jim Plunkett, um, <laughs> Lester Hayes, all those guys. And so I was just blown away. Like I was amongst greatness and guys have been there for 10 plus years, you know, long time. Um, I can remember coach Flores got up and there's like 150 guys. So the guys that they're there from the year before, and then these free agents and then these draft picks, and he goes, look, it's all fun and games right now, and that's great. But just know, and this is during the spring, he goes, just know 
that at the end of the summer, when we go through training camp, there's only going to be 55 of you guys sitting here. And I looked around and I said, I don't know who you're talking about, but you know, I'm going to be one of those. And I, and I said this question to myself, which I, which I've, I've, I've really, it, it's really played out in interesting ways um, because so often people put you down or so often people don't, you know, you come up with some big wild dream and then people doubt which your ability and what you can, you can actually do. And I, I just said this thing, like, why not me? Why can't I be that guy? Why can't I be the person? Like, even though I'm, I was seventh round draft pick and they drafted somebody in the first round in the third round at wide receiver, why can't I still make the team? I got to figure out a way how this is going to happen. And, and so then you dig in and, you know, it's just like, if you've ever wanted to be super focused on and laser on certain things, if you ask that question, why not me? You also got to follow it up with that grit, that determination, you know, that just all out commitment to detail, commitment to excellence of what you want to accomplish in life. I think so many people nowadays, you know, a lot's going on. I get that in the world, but they're like, woe is me, not why not me. And for years, mm. I was like, I want to cover football. So finally, yeah. I was like, okay, why, why not? You know, you and you have to have that attitude, but not everyone does. And it's hard. And you have to be motivated to play sports. Uh, I was the cheerleader, but I always loved them. But it's just the commitment and the motivation. You have to want it. And of course, the competitive spirit, you know, it lives on in you and it well forever and ever since you went to, you know, from football to mountains climbing. But so it's just, it's amazing because a lot of people, you know, 150 and 50, some made it you know, two thirds went bye-bye and you're like, well, I don't care. I'm going to be on that team. I I mean, the power of positive thinking I know in life, but in sports and visualizing, did you just, especially when you got to the pros, I mean, you were with Howie Long, those guys, I mean, heroes, you just go, you know, I'm going to visualize this and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to, you have to put the work in though as well. Well, I think that's a big part of it though. Again, it's like I said before, it's physical, it's mental and spiritual. Um, and you got to have all those three things in alignment to accomplish great things. And um, I did. I, I used to dream like this. Where I really started in high school, I used to think about, you know, jumping up in there and catching the ball over people and coming down and scoring touchdowns. And like I, 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 could, I could just like shut my eyes and see myself try, jumping up. And 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 there's all this happening. And then. In, in college, the same thing happened. My first game, I, I, I actually started was against Michigan. We're down by 14 points going into the fourth quarter. And we come back and we score a touchdown and they get the ball. They go all the way down the field. They miss a field goal. So now we're down by seven. We get the ball back, have to go 80 yards. We go all the way down the end of the field. And in the last 14 seconds, they call my number and they throw me a, a ball in the corner of the end zone. I jump up and catch it over the guy. We win the game and won Sports Illustrated. And it was amazing, but I had done that, that like, even though that was an amazing moment, I had done that play a million times visualizing of doing that exact same thing um, that, that actually happened. And then my, my last play was, is in the orange bowl with the exact same thing happen again. We were down, it threw a couple minutes ago, caught in the back corner of the end zone, we win the game. And, but the same thing I had visualized that it was an incredible catch and it was amazing in the moment and all that kind of stuff. But, but I, I don't think I would have been able to take that on if I hadn't put in all the work, run out in all these stadiums, going in front of the Rose Bowl, 110,000 when I was a freshman. I didn't really, I didn't play. I went back again the second year. I didn't play, but I was exposed to it. And so it, it just gave me that confidence. Like, you know what? I can do this. Right. But it just had to go through those experiences to get to that point and that visualization to really grasp what it takes to do, you know, amazing things. Well, it's funny. I interview a lot of, I cover a lot of rodeo as well. And I, a good friend of mine just won a six world title and broke all these records. And I looked at him, I go, I, I said, when you won the college rodeo, you were being interviewed and this was, you know, 10 plus years ago. And the gal goes, did you expect to win? And he said, yeah, you come in and you say, I'm going to win or why be here? you know, you're going to do it. You're going to go be a great wide receiver. You're going to, you know, do this. If you don't think about there's a difference between confidence and being cocky, but I think it's a fine line, especially in pro football. I mean, what was that locker room? Like as a rookie, you had to come in and prove yourself with all these guys. And it's like, how did you keep the confidence up when these guys had been around for a long time? And you obviously wanted to learn from them as well. I think it's just, again, going back to life, it's not getting, caught up in all the circumstances of everybody else. I just kept saying, what can I do? 
That's the only thing I had control over is, you know, catch every ball is coming to me, steady the plays, not screw up. And it's amazing how many people get, get blown out just from they either get injured or they haven't studied their plays or they're late or they have a drug problem or they're drinking. You know, it's just like it, it's all there. And you'd think that it wouldn't because you're at the NFL level. But that's just the case. And it was, it's the case on every single team that's out there. And you have people who just really understand what a professional means and other people that just haven't made that transition from college. And I don't know why they would have succeeded and why they did it in college, but some of the people, you know, were able to, 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 to take shortcuts. And at the end of the day, there, there's just no shortcuts uh, to the top. Well, nowadays they make so much money and they have their cars and that, you know, and they, and they still, some of them get into trouble and I don't get it. I'm like, you have this opportunity, yeah. you have this gift and you work hard at it, but you know, to each his own, they, it's just a different, it's a different ball game these days for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, one of your best college memories or, or sorry, football memories, one of your best football memories. I know there have to be a ton and you just showed me four rings. So uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to pinpoint. I mean, and, and, you know, certainly it, they always say you always remember your last play, right? And and going back to college in the Orange Bowl, we're down the two for two weeks. We we weren't supposed to win. I mean, the only thing that came short of that is, and this is really where the whole BCS um, thing came to play, um, because uh, BYU um, back back in the day played in a sub conference. I guess they still do. And they ended up um, beating a subpar six and six Michigan team that year in the Holiday Bowl, um, right around Christmas time. And then they had to wait around while all these other higher ranked teams played. They ended up being number one. We ended up being number two. So the only thing that was short of that, but to, to, to go there to beat that team that was the boss, you know, back in those days and <laughs> all that stuff. And, you know, it was really remarkable to have a West Coast team. It was the first time a Pac 10 team had ever played. Um, in the orange bowl and, and to have made that catch, which, which was, you know, a lot of fun. And, and so there's a lot of memories tied to that. Um, there's a lot of memories tied to my whole college and, and the NFL is just, it's just a different animal. You know, it's more transactional, you know, I was there, I wasn't, I was there, I wasn't, I was there. And then I got traded and then they're there and then there's a free agency and there's all this stuff going on. So it's just harder to, to maintain, um, at, at, at that level. And, and there's no real loyalties going between the owners. You're always on the verge of being cut. They're always bringing new players in to replace you. So it's just a different animal. Well, and we're going to talk about, you said it's, you know, always as good as your last play. We're going to talk about your last play next week. And then also going from the end of your pro career to your business, to climbing all these mountains crazy and your summit to Everest uh, last May 2021 and all that happened. So stick around for next week, more with Mark Patterson right here on Beyond the Locker Room with Maria. Hey everyone, it's time for Maria's Minute and I'm going to make this short and sweet. Uh, after my great interviews with Mark Pat- Patterson, why not me? Why can't I do this? Uh, I just want to say happy holidays, be safe, Set your goals and just be thankful, be blessed. Um, that's all I have to say. It's I'm so blessed and to meet all these great people, take some time this holiday season, be safe, of course, and just give back to others and just put a smile on your face because it will make someone else's day as well. So we'll see you next week. More with Mark Pavson and his climb to Everest and everything in between. He's an amazing person. So more with him and of course, more with all the NFL's latest. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and download podcast or vlog wherever you are. Thanks.